much to Eli and Talia for the presentation um, and the quite striking visuals as well. And uh, thanks to men for introducing me. My name is Rasmus Nilsson. Uh, I'm the director of the Reuters Institute for the study of journalism at the University of Oxford and professor of political communication. So I will take some questions from the Slido. Uh, this is a rich discussion. There'll probably be more questions than we can take in the next 15 minutes. So I'll encourage everyone to pursue them in the chat function with one another, um, either uh, through back channel um, or, or on social media or elsewhere too. But just to sort of start us off before we dive into the Slido, um, Eli and Talia, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what you think the role of research is in driving this conversation towards an understanding of what good public uh, friendly design looks like in a digital environment. Um, hopefully there are some things we have in common, um, but might there also be areas where we simply disagree um, and that some people will ask for more um, um, consistent enforcement of consistent content moderation policies, for example, even as others will feel that such enforcement is a form of censorship, uh, as we see very powerfully right now with um, allegations by Republicans that they're being censored, calls from Democrats um, for more enforcement, uh, things that are not just US discussions, but also happening, for example, in India, where BJP has been very critical of decisions taken against Mr. Trump, uh, just as the Indian Congress uh, has has uh, supported the decisions made by some of the platform companies. W what do you think the role of research is in informing this conversation, which I suppose is also in part about uh, principled disagreement or different interests and identities? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think um, one of the conclusions that we came to, uh, the more time that we spent with uh, the, the survey results and the more time we spent talking to folks is that, um, you know, there is no way to optimize digital space for everyone uh, and for every community or culture. That that's sort of a fundamental challenge of our current digital landscape is we're, we're trying to fit um, different cultures and societies with very different norms and ways of being into one, you know, or into a handful of containers. And um, so I think that in itself is one one important piece. Um, I think the other piece is, you know, the way when we think about this metaphor and we think about the public spaces that exist in the physical world, you know, there is this uh, element of kind of community feedback and ownership often that helps shape what the norms are in a space, what's acceptable. There are places where some kinds of dress are acceptable and other, other places where they're not. And that's mm -hmm. um, something that's mediated by, by community feedback mechanisms. And we don't really have those in, in digital spaces. So I think to your question, what's the role of research? Uh, you know, what we were looking for is kind of um, a set of qualities that we could identify that were pretty consistent. Yeah, and how I can speak to that. Um, a little more, uh, you know, so that, and someone mentioned kind of a pattern language, we could then start thinking about well, what are the different patterns for how people might design around these qualities. And I'll just add to that, that I think there's a really important role for research here. I think it's first in surfacing what are values or things that we can agree upon are things that are important for public space and digital public space for that matter. And I think what we'll find is that there are trade-offs among these, right? You can move the lever on one and maybe it, uh, maybe it affects the other in a certain way. But if we have a wide variety of different platforms and we agree on these values, even though we might agree, might disagree on which one needs to be prioritized or which platform really speaks to us, we still have this rich ecosystem in which we can all, all in which we can work together. And one thing that's really striking about the signals is how much agreement there really was I think when you move this to the space of like, what are our values? What do we want? You actually see more agreement than you might anticipate. And I think that if we start the conversation there, then you can start to have trade-offs like, yeah, we want free speech, but no, we don't really want people to be able to do certain types of free speech. And there, then you can wrestle with them, but you're still wrestling with the meat of the values that everyone can say, this is a good set of signals or values for us to play with. Uh, thanks, uh, Eli and Talia. It's, it's good to be reminded that there is evidence to suggest that we have more in common as human beings than the fact that we exist in Newtonian space. Um, I'm going to resurface a question here from JSL from the Slido, uh, which I think pushes further on this uh, issue 
of disagreement, uh, which effectively is a question about whether even in the situations that Taylor are right to highlight where we say we want the same thing, um, maybe sometimes we mean different things uh, with the same words. So JSL asks, does what look like welcome for some look unwelcoming uh, for others? That question is a great question. And to me, it brings to mind uh, the work that Nathan Matias, and I, I think he may be around or maybe uh, some of his uh, colleagues may be around, um, has been doing, which is really um, thinking about what it means to encourage participation in this space and the way that norms and rules contrary to the way that we often think about it, actually are a critical part of encouraging participation. So um, what Nathan found on, on our science in a study that he did was that when you published um, you know, more clear rules and guidelines, um, you saw not only more participation by first time users in general, but particularly folks who are kind of coming from um, you know, more marginalized or disadvantaged backgrounds felt more comfortable because they felt like they understood what the rules of the space were and presumably you know felt like there was someone who was going to be watching those those rules and so i think what we mean when we say welcome isn't a free for all um, and that's a common kind of misperception of how folks think about that but it but it really is trying to address this tragedy of the of a, a lot of internet spaces which is that so many people just silence themselves because they don't feel totally comfortable that they're welcome to speak in the first place and to us that's you know a, a big loss and what i'd add to that is i think that in our research to date uh, this is actually one of the limitations, right? We've talked to super users. So these are people that in some way have bought in, although certainly we saw plenty of criticism from those that were super users. But I think that it begs to ask the same sorts of questions of people who aren't using some of these spaces. Why aren't they using them? And what, what might be the fault in terms of the signals maybe not being, uh, not being present for them? So I think that that actually is a, a wonderful provocation for where we could take some of this uh, in future iterations. Thanks both. Um, in your both your framing of the issues that we face as societies, but also in your research findings and interpretations of it, you stress that we can't and, and maybe even shouldn't seek uh, for a single platform to be all things for all people, a, 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 a view that I certainly share personally. Um, and I think this is a question that is alluded to in, in a point that's been raised by an anonymous participant on the Slido who asks, if you were someone with aspirations of creating a new platform, how would you be thinking about the signals? Where would you start? We hope that the signals are used in this way. And if I were doing something like that, I would start from the very beginning thinking about how do you create a space that has at its base, at its foundation, these signals. So I might look to physical spaces that you think perform particularly well on these signals and ask how can you translate that to digital space? I might look at particular digital spaces where I thought that these signals were performing well. And even from our survey, what sorts of platforms are, are quantitatively ranking well in terms of performing. And I would draw all sorts of inspiration from physical space, from uh, existing digital spaces, and from the very beginning, bake it into the values that are put into that platform. Yeah, I would also say, um, and again, there's more of this detail on the website, but um... There's so much room for improvement on a lot of these. <laughs> and um, one in particular that I think just about no platform was seen as doing especially well on was humanization. Um, and, uh, you know, that seems like a really important uh, project to be thinking about. Like, how do we build digital spaces where people come away with a real sense of, of other people as human beings? Um, I know Juliana Schroeder is somewhere around and we reference her work, but um, thinking partly about, you know, sort of what's possible in text only mediums versus other mediums, if, if you want to accomplish that, seems like a really interesting direction to go for, for this. I'm going to pick a name now that um, someone has asked under, um, under their own name. Uh, this is Robert Bjarnson who asks, um, when we think about this diversity of platforms and diversity of, of signals and design principles, how, in your view, can bottom-up nonprofit approaches to building public digital spaces work in our hyper-commercial world? You know, I think that's a really critical piece of the puzzle. And, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but 
uh, when you use the spatial metaphor and you think about all of the different kind of institutions and spaces in a physical community, um, and, and folks talked about this in the panel earlier, you know, there are uh, private businesses, absolutely, but there are also um, libraries and parks and all of these all of these civic spaces that are, uh, you know, if you, if you try to imagine what a library would look like as a VC backed startup, it wouldn't be a library anymore, it would be something else. And so um, I think the role for these situated, um, you know, uh, non nonprofit enterprises that are that have the expertise that have the kind of maintainers in them that are helping do this work of weaving the community together is incredibly important. In some ways, I think it's like one of the biggest things that's missing from the way that we imagine how the tech landscape is supposed to work is we like often often forget all the, how, how critical that work is in, in human societies. If I can just add uh, in case Robert or others are interested in it, that uh, obviously there are scholars who worked on nonprofit approaches like Christina Dunbar Hester in the United States. and at the risk of coming across to those of you who are in America as if I come from an alternate reality where as I only come <laughs> from Europe, um, it is also perhaps worth pointing out that there are discussions in Europe about what we might think of as a public option. Uh, and Natalie Helberger in particular from the University of Amsterdam has done really, I think, impressive and interesting and important work in that space. Um, Thanks. And actually, while, while we're on that topic, let me just say uh, both tomorrow um, and Thursday, we'll hear both from some entrepreneurs of kind of new, new forms of public space and from Ethan Zuckerman and others on Thursday who are, who've been thinking about this. So it's a theme that we hope to return to. I'm gonna to return to another theme that uh, has really resonated with a lot of people who've asked questions in Slido that you alluded to as well in the presentation. Um, and it's the point about how you're thinking about how different platforms uh, serve different functions. Uh, how, how do you think about this sort of looking forward to kind of the sort of public friendly design principles that you hope will underlie um, our digital space in the future. I mean, I think Eli just started our thinking down that path, which is we look at the signals right now and see what's missing. Humanization is a big one, for instance. Uh, ensuring people's safety is another one where we actually find a lot of people saying they're, they're not totally satisfied with the existing offerings. And so I think that these are opportunities for new platforms to come in and to really do a good job at some of these things that people broadly say are important. They say they're interested in this. And so I think that the, the signals expose these, these new options and opportunities. And at the same time, we can also see existing platforms uh, try to do better at some of these things, particularly the ones where people say they're really important for the platform and the platform isn't performing well. But we actually think that it's pretty impossible for any platform to do them all and do them all perfectly well. We have to have this, this uh, diversity of spaces uh, that satisfy different signals uh, while trying to achieve all of them, but recognizing that there are certain spaces that will probably need to be quite distinct from others in order to make it all work. If I can push you just a little bit further uh, on that, Talia, I mean, are, is what you're describing sort of roughly analogous to thinking about the way that say the New York Times and NPR and Fox are competing with one another, uh, not just on sort of technology and content, but also on identity and principles and, and ethics in a way. Um, is, is what you're describing a situation in which we should think of design principles as a competitive differentiator basically between different platforms with different business models? I would say yes, in terms of potentially a competitive differentiator, but I think when we're thinking about the world of the signals, we're thinking about things like maybe there's a place where you particularly go where power is accessible, where you have a chance to talk to those in uh, positions of power. And maybe there's a platform that really does well at that. And then there's another one maybe that really helps you to cultivate belonging and feel like you're connected to others. And I don't think that's analogous to our current media landscape because they're certainly not competing on these signals. They're competing using very different means from that. But I do think that there's a landscape where whether it's competition or whether it's just places that have naturally found their, their niche, their place where they, they have provided a space that really satisfies this public goal, this public uh, signal that we share. I'll take a last question, I think, in terms of these, just the interest of time, um, which um, I, I think, again, returns to one of the themes. Um, 
which is a question again from an anonymous participant who asks, what, if anything, would be lost if we fractured into smaller public spaces than the big platforms that tend to dominate much of online space right now? You know, I think there, it's easy to feel some um, nostalgia or preemptive nostalgia for the notion of kind of like one, one global connected medium, even though that's really not we don't have that now, uh, you know, very much. I mean, it's it's not um, a reality in how we use these platforms mostly. And so um, I think uh, looking to a world where we have public digital spaces that are doing the work of public space, which means it's not all people like me, it's not all, um, you know, uh, uh, frictionless, and there are these opportunities to see, um, you know, a, a larger whole. Um, that seems really critical. Whether we can do that, you know, all in one at, at one global scale seems to me to be a, a, a very open question. But I think, um, you know, I'm really interested in sort of the opposite, which is like, yeah, how do we build much more localized spaces that do some of this sort of social weaving work? Um, that then we can maybe build upon. And I think that that's absolutely correct that, you know, there's some movement toward these more localized spaces, but I think the parts that we have to make sure don't get lost in the process are one, the ability to understand the concerns of others. So if you just start to form local bubbles and then concerns that might be really important for another group never come your way, I think that's problematic. And then the second is to make sure that we still preserve these opportunities for an incidental or, or accidental encounter with someone else who you might not know. And, you know, I find this happens to me on Twitter, for example, where I never knew someone and all of a sudden we, we have lots in common. And I think that there's something really important about uh, the ability of social media, for example, to do exactly this. Well, I mean, the signal, Eli and Talia, that you sent to us that you um, wanted to pursue here was to start a conversation. And my strictly scientific analysis of the questions coming in on Slido is that you have succeeded beyond your wildest dreams on that. So I'll just thank both of you for the colorful presentation and the rigorous thinking and empirical work and for fielding all these questions. There are many more in the Slido and on the chat, and I'm sorry I couldn't uh, find time to file, file uh, all of them to you, but thanks so much for kicking this off and for all the work that you and the team and everyone involved um, has do, done to start this conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs>